it. Work versus theft. One of the problems in discussions of work is that they are usually set in a false frame of reference. A false picture is possible with accurate but limited data. Thus, man can be defined in terms of his sexuality or his race, without a single misstatement of fact, and yet with a radical perversion of the truth. A man is more than his race or gender. Where work is concerned, the false frameworks are many. The subject can be approached in terms of the relationship of the employer and the employed, or the class status of the work, or the state regulations governing work, and so on. Such an approach reduced work not only to economics, but, unhappily, to politically controlled or union-controlled economics. Work is a subject inclusive of both capital, labour and much more. Work is also a moral fact, a moral statement. St. Paul calls attention to this moral and theological aspect of work in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labour, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Again, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, St. Paul says, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Men now seriously limit the meaning of Paul's words to have theft mean merely the act of a criminal who robs others. The law and the prophets are clear that the meaning is far more inclusive. The old English divine Paul Bean, died 1617, saw clearly what theft means. First, he that by any injustice getteth from his neighbours, he stealeth before God. As if by unlawful means I get anything, or by abuse of lawful means. Bean included many bankruptcies, gamesters, false wits, measures, and false wares, lies with intent to defraud, and much more. Next, said Bean, the second way of stealth is by withholding that our neighbour should have, as to withhold dues from the commonwealth, from the church, from the poor, to withhold wages from the servants, if it be but the least space of time to his loss, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 13. The wages of him that is hired shall not abide with thee all night until the morning. Third, being said very tellingly, If we endamage by giving heedless the occasion of our neighbour's hurt, or by not preventing his hurt when we are able, it is against the commandments, Thou shalt not steal, as those laws of kindling fire, of not helping our neighbour's beast under his burden, do testify. Now, we partake with others when, by counsel, concealment, sharing with them, gaining wittingly by their stealth, as brokers that buy this or that for naught which a thief hath stolen, are thieves at the second hand receiving. Now then, this thus opened, how many Christians continue stealing? How many overreach in bargaining? Use deceit and wits, how many by lying, false reckoning, by wicked borrowing, how many thievish nibbles, how many careless what scare they do another. We that are Christians must take heed we get not anything unrighteously. Nebus vineyard did eat out all that wretched king's possessions. A little got by stealth may waste great substance. Men think it is a little thing, but, be the gain never so small, it excuseth not theft. Be a man not with a woman, rich or poor, noble or base, fair or foul, his uncleanness is not excused. Again, he that for a little will sin, will mend his service if the devil will mend his wages. Above all overreach, not poor ones, it be but a penny matter, it may be that penny is like the widow's mite, all they have. 
God is an avenger of all these things. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 6. I cite Bain from almost 400 years ago to make clear how the church once viewed Paul's text. Some commentators now say that the church in Ephesus apparently had some converted thieves, and hence Paul's comment. There is no evidence for this. What we do know is that the Roman Empire had a welfare economy. The kind of theft described by Bain was then commonplace. We have the same situation today. Industrial and other corporations, farmers, workers, non-workers and others all want to live by legalised theft, by subsidies, welfare grants, protective tariffs and much, much more. Paul lived in a time when highly respectable and unrespectable men alike exploited the Roman Empire and its treasury. We must see Paul's meaning to profit by his words. Among modern commentators, Marcus Bars has seen this also. In the Greek text, the word thief is not used, but rather the stealing one. Paul calls for honest work. The stealing ones made money without working. Exploited slaves and employees took advantage of those in need, robbed God, as did Ananias and Sapphira, Acts chapter 5, verses 1 to 11, and others, such as non-tithers. In Bart's words, their way of making a living is according to the Apostle's message, no less opposed to the order of God's people than is a successful career in burglary, larceny, embezzlement or bank robbery. In either case, thievery may be or become a profession. All are to labour, doing that which is good, that is, lawful, profitable and godly. As Solomon says, Whoso keepeth the fig tree shall eat the fruit thereof, so he that waiteth on his master shall be honoured. Proverbs chapter 27 verse 18 In other words, a tree bears fruit when labour is expended upon it. A good master, whether it be man or God, rewards one who serves faithfully. We are given a moral antithesis between stealing and work. This moral antithesis rests on a theological one. It is a statement concerning reality. Those who love death and hate God, Proverbs chapter 8, verse 36, will live by theft and will get their wages. Death, Romans chapter 6, verse 23. The Lord's people will choose life and God's law and will be blessed with his care and with eternal life. Paul laid emphasis on manual labour in his own life, as well as in his teaching. To work with one's own hands may have been an idiom for gainful work. This was an ancient biblical and Hebraic emphasis, and one the Greco-Roman world needed badly. It is interesting to see what Paul says in Romans chapter 2, verses 21 to 23. Thou, therefore, which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law dishonorest thou God? He identifies as hypocrisy and as breaking God's law three sins which he links closely. Theft, as has been already described, adultery and sacrilege. The indirect, legalised thefts and a covert sin like adultery performed in secrecy are compared to sacrilege. The stealing ones gain things from others legally but immorally. Socialism is the essence of such a way of life. Paul lived in such a world. The opposite of theft is work, but, more accurately, work to have something to share with the needy. It is commanded that those who refuse to work be not fed. 
charity to such is a sin. They are not needy, but sinful. Thus Paul commands honest work in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. Compare 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 12. Those who will not work, Paul says, become busybodies, disorderly people bent on managing others. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 10 to 12. As against status welfare, a Christian concern for one another is required. Thus, we work in terms of God's dominion mandate to create a godly society. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. We work to provide for our own household. For, as Paul says, But if any provide not for his own, and specially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. This sentence requires the care of our own families and our Christian family, Christ's people. Psalm 102 verse 9 says of those who are faithful in obedience to God's command to relieve the needy, He, the good man, hath dispersed, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness endureth forever, his horn shall be exalted with honour. Turning again to Bain, for a telling comment, we are told, If we will perform this duty acceptably, we must look to three things. 1. To the ground of our arms. 2. To the end. 3. The manner. 1. The ground of it must be a loving and merciful heart. This is the soul of an alms deed. If we should give all we have without love, it were nothing. 2. We must do it, only eyeing God's glory and our neighbour's need, not for ostentation. He that distributeth must do it in simplicity. Romans chapter 12, verse 8. Many will sound trumpets and blaze abroad deeds of this nature. 3. For the manner of it, it must be readily. Be ready to distribute. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 18. Cheerfully. God loveth a cheerful giver. Liberally. He that soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly. It should be noted that Bain used the old word, alms, a word now in disrepute. The socialist movement heaped scorn from its earliest days on, quote, almsgiving, end quote, as though it manifested some kind of social disease. There was a reason for this attitude. They wanted to replace almsgiving with socialism and theft. We need to restore the biblical perspective, work, tithing, and giving to the needy. Until we do so, we shall have a civilization whose premise is advancement through theft. The politics of theft insists that it represents brotherly love in action, but it divides men by feeding envy and class conflict. A critique of the politics of thefts will not, in and of itself, alter men and nations. Only regenerate men who take work, tithing and giving to the needy as a mandate from the Lord can restructure society.